Thanks so much to everyone who's here. My name is Mary McPherson. I'm on the DOE off, uh, team at the State and Community Energy Programs Office that manages a few workforce development programs. And today, during this webinar, we're going to talk about the state-based home energy efficiency contractor training grants program, for which we announced funding in July. This webinar was a labor of love from a few different people, including uh, the team at the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, of Allison Moe, Sarah Truitt, and Taylor Ryan. Uh, Jeff Wainer, Water, excuse me, Warner uh, at Pacific Northwest National Lab, PNNL, is also on the team, and uh, myself from SCEP. Next slide, please. So before we get too far into the slides, I will make sure everyone knows that we will be sharing these slides after the webinar as well as a recording. So you don't have to take vigorous notes. Um, we'll also allow, allow Q&A throughout the presentation and see, we'll work to address your questions as they come in, but we've reserved time at the end of the presentation for a more robust Q&A. So just let us know in the chat when you have questions. I'll start the webinar by giving an overview of the Contractor Training Grants, ALRD, and then Allison will lead a presentation on the State Workforce Development Plan requirements. So we have a slide on each of these six requirements on the screen. Then Jeff will talk about several support resources for ALRD responses that we hope will be helpful to you as you draft your applications. And then we'll move on to Q&A. Next slide. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of the, uh, the new contractor training program that we just announced. The goals of this program are to reduce the cost of contractor training, to also provide testing and certification of contractors and their employees, and to partner with nonprofit organizations to develop and implement these programs. Next slide. So this slide summarizes the allowable activities under the ALRD. This includes hard and soft skill training, um, testing and certification, classes on entrepreneurship, workforce readiness and job placement, uh, job quality promotion efforts and activities that support underserved communities. One thing I'll note on the hard skill training is that PNNL is developing additional resources to support state responses on this front. And so they're gonna talk more about them at the end of this webinar. Next slide. This is a visual representation of the ALRD there's a lot going on in that document we know. And so, uh, but today we're just gonna focus on the residential energy workforce needs assessment as part of the state workforce development plan. Next slide. This just is, a, is another visual representation of the focus of today's webinar. We've got at least one slide on each of these components. So I won't go into them now. Next slide. And lastly, to give a snapshot of what Jeff will be sharing, DOE is working with PNNL to develop various support materials to help you as you develop your applications. So this includes compiled references as best practice examples of existing workforce development programs. And it also includes a narrative document template that can be used as a framework for your submissions. One thing to note, though, is that we're not requiring states use these materials. We're just offering them as optional resources to you. So we're working to get those out as soon as possible. But in the meantime, there's a, uh, an existing resource that I recommend you all check out called the Building Science Education Solution Center, where DOE has curated training modules and examples of curricula and certifications that I think you could build into your contractor training programs. Thanks, next slide. So I'll hand it over to Allison now to talk us through some of the resources you could leverage as you build out your workforce training plans. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, so Mary just sort of des described what I'm gonna be talking about. It is gonna be a lot of me for the next 30 minutes. So uh, be prepared for that. I will also say I've already seen a couple of questions in the chat 
that are related to other parts of the ALRD. So um, we have reserved room at the end, uh, as Mary said, at the end of this webinar for some general questions, but, um, and Mary, maybe you wanna respond to those questions now, but uh, we're, we're focused right now on the needs ass assessment. So, um, uh, let's see. So we're going to start with um, the statement of need, which is the supply demand gap analysis. And before I, I, I delve into that, I just want to say that for all of the things that we're covering today, uh, SCEP really recommend, recommends and encourages all of you to partner with your state workforce agencies. They should be well versed in a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today. But the purpose of, of what we're doing today is to give sort of a common place for you all to be starting with and to share some methodologies that SCEP has approved for, for responding to this ALRD. So uh, if you want to head to the next slide. Okay, so component 1A. So in this, in this section of the ALRD, it asks states to provide a statement of need that clearly articulates the current supply of qualified skilled energy efficiency workers compared to the projected future demand. So there's two parts here, right? We have supply. And so I'm going to be talking about um, resources for estimating labor market supply when we get to 1D. It's related to 1D. Um, and then right now is the demand side. So I'm going to be talking about resources to help identify the demand that would be associated with deploying the, the rebate investments um, using state jobs multipliers. Um, so, um, and just a reminder, you'll need both of these to answer 1A, but I'm going to just talk about them in the order that they go. So next slide. Okay, the methodology that we are sharing here today, and SCEP, SCEP has approved this, but it involves using job multipliers. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with that is, it's a, it's a number that, that says based on a certain deployment amount. So, you know, in, deploy, in, in solar or wind, that might be um, megawatts of energy, for, for example. But um, in, in the case of energy efficiency, it's a number per million dollars invested in energy efficiency. So a certain number of jobs, and that's the sort of basis for what you can do here. So. Um, if you want to come up with this calculation of demand, you want to estimate the total building efficiency or electrification investment that you anticipate in your state. So this is multiple things. So it's the, the rebate allocations that have been assigned to your state for homes in here. Um, but it's also con uh, the contributions by consumers, right? So the rebates are only covering a portion of the upgrades that people may be requesting. So you have to think about how much you think, how much out of pocket consumers may be spending total uh, leveraged against your rebate dollars. And then if you have any additional um, leveraged funds or if you're doing this for a different program, um, then you'll wanna think about those funds. But you wanna understand your total investment that you think is associated um, with what you're doing divide it by a million, um, and then multiply it by your state's energy efficiency jobs multiplier. So um, you're all going to see a copy of these slides later. Um, but uh, there's a link in here that where that goes right to the document. And this is a, a, a document that was put together by NREL and published last year in coordination with the state energy program. Um, and so what this gives you um, is a rough estimate <laughs> Uh, of the total number of direct jobs leveraged by the rebate investment in your state. Um, and so two things about that, it is rough. So this isn't intended to be like a detailed jobs modeling, right? So the multipliers we have made a lot of assumptions baked into that. If you know of different things going on and you have the capabilities to do uh, jobs, jobs modeling in your state, by all means, you are welcome to do that. But if you don't have a great place to start for this, this is a good um, sort of way to, to sort of get a back of the envelope, a rough order of magnitude of the, the type, the number of jobs that would be supported by this. Um, the other thing in that sort of last statement on the slide I want to point out is it has to do with the direct jobs. So that is relevant to um, what is being asked in this ALRD. So direct jobs, if you're not familiar with this sort of terminology, I know we're throwing a lot at you and it's only like a few slides in, but um, direct jobs are um, the jobs involved in the installation or the operation of whatever technologies you're investing it in. So it does not include things like supply chain jobs that may be associated with that. That's referred to as indirect jobs. It also doesn't reflect like the broader changes, jobs that may be created by additional spending in your region. That's something that's called induced jobs. So what this will give you, the multipliers that we have in this report will give you like the actual jobs needed to install whatever funding that you are investing in. Um, so then you can go to the next slide. Um, so some other things to consider when you put together this, um, this estimate. Uh, so 
the jobs total that you get if you follow that little methodology we showed in the last slide is for the overall investment and that is independent of time so say you did the math and you think that your investment will support a thousand jobs in your state if your state spends all that money in one year that's a thousand jobs in one year if you plan to stretch that money over the four years that you are allowed to to do or, or longer right for the uh, for the rebates then that's going to be fewer jobs uh, over each year. So you want to just think about that when you're recording the number of jobs supported is, is it, you know, if it's over the course of, of multiple years or if it's jobs in, in a given year. Um, you'll also want to make some determinations about whether you think the jobs that are being supported by this investment are new jobs or existing jobs, right, that might require upskilling. So again, we're not going to we're not here to tell you the, the best way to make that decision, but um, consider, you know, whether envelope or uh, electrification uh, is, is the thing. So for example, um, if you think most of the people who may get heat pumps through here funding, you know, will do it when their existing furnace or hot water heater goes out, then those jobs may not be new jobs. They would just be differently skilled jobs. Um, you know, instead of replacing it with a traditional gas furnace, they may be replacing it with a heat pump, for example. So it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one um, new jobs. Now, granted, there may be um, additional jobs that are that are created through things like if you have to upgrade service panels and things like that, electrician jobs. So um, versus if you think that people, a lot of the people getting insulation or air sealing measures through the homes program, if you think they may not do it otherwise, if it were not for the rebates, then those would be sort of net or new jobs. So again, you're going to have to think through all of those things and how you predict or how you think that some of that may be um, played out in your state. Uh, the other thing you're going to want to think about, because there are a lot of questions in this ALRD that have to do with occupations. So, you know, we have a total number of jobs, but that's going to be in a variety of different occupations. And so there's a, there's a, you can see here, there's a link uh, in this particular bullet, but there is a document NREL created for a different project that talks about the different types of occupations associated with um, energy efficiency versus electrification um, upgrades. So that can maybe help to give you a sense there. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So that was one A. Uh, the next section of this of this piece is one B. And if you want to move to the next, yeah, slide. So one B says that states need to provide a statement of need that clearly articulates. Oh, this is not. Sorry, that click. Sorry, uh, it says it asks states to indicate the program that you plan to use these funds for. So a reminder, it can be used for homes, which is the home energy performance based whole house rebate program. It can be used for here, um, or it can be used for other federal, state, or utility funded programs. Uh, so that includes um, Bill or the IIJA um, and other things. So we're not providing guidance today uh, on how to do this particular thing. It's going to be up to each state to determine which program you intend to use that grant funding for. Next slide. Oh man, we are just zipping through these things today. Um, so 1C, yep, uh, so 1C asks states to identify existing programs within your jurisdiction that meet residential energy contractor and worker needs. So they wanna see a list of organizations that provide training, credentialing and or wraparound services. So over the next couple of slides, I'm gonna provide some resources that may help you identify and uh, engage with those existing programs. Um, and before we move to the next, Slide. We have a poll. We're trying to take a slight break from me talking at you the whole time. So um, Taylor just put us a, a poll up on the slide. So uh, I want to have a sense right now of what workforce related agencies people on this call are already engaging with before we give suggestions of who else you may want to talk to. So we've got a few answers. I'm going to leave that up for a little bit if people can put it in there. This is more useful for everyone else on the call to see who else you all are working with, but we can go to the next slide while people are still continuing that that call. So this is a graphic that shows the variety um, of different types of stakeholders that are part of the broader, what I'm going to call the workforce ecosystem. So um, big picture workforce development is focused on 
the participant on the or on the trainee, and it's about preparing them to meet the needs of employers. So that support comes from a lot of different places. We have sort of five buckets in this graphic that you see. There's the traditional education system. That's um, high schools, community colleges, universities, tech schools. There's the workforce system. So that's a lot of people. That's employers. That's unions. But that's also um, you know job centers, workforce development boards, local labor departments, things like that. Um, you have community partners and service agencies. Um, so you can see some of those listed there. And, and really the, those ones that I just mentioned are the, the focus for this ALRD. Those are the ones that were mentioned in, in the ALRD and are called out. But there are other organizations and people that are gonna be involved in this, whether directly you engage with them or not is sort of up to you. But just to be aware that, um, you know, for example, there may be other funders involved, you know, philanthropic funders, other government funding bodies or entities, and you may want to coordinate with them if they're funding similar things. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's the individual support system, um, right, their teachers, their mentors, their peers, and their families. And, and it's not that you necessarily need to be engaged with those groups, but being aware that there are a lot of people um, sort of involved in, in everything that goes into workforce development. So um, before I go on, let's see the results of the poll. We had 24 people, which is pretty good response rate. I'm just curious. Are you showing the results? I might not be seeing them. I'm not seeing them. Well, hopefully everyone else is seeing. I'm only seeing the poll question number one and not the results. We're having tough technical difficulties always. Hmm. Okay, well, Taylor <laughs> can see them and we can, but we will take a look at those. I think it's, it, you know, we'll be sharing some of the resources from this later. And, and if, if there are useful examples of partners that we that have come out from what you all shared, we can maybe share them with the larger group because I think it'll be interesting to, um, yeah, I'm not seeing them either. Sorry, we tried, we tried to be participatory. <laughs> um, so on to the next slide, what we've prepared in terms of guidance for helping you do this. Um, and I don't know if Taylor, if you're able to like put the link to this Airtable in the chat right now, um, but we created an, Air, an Airtable, which is essentially like a, a spreadsheet. Um, and, and this is, uh, it has uh, links for the, for ways to search for people in each of these categories, search for organizations in each of these categories. Uh, and so you can see, it's sort of hard to see. I know there's a lot on this screen, but there's all of the, the sort of, you know, the recognized training organizations uh, that are mentioned in the ALRD. So you can get links to all of those and those links go directly to their, their find a trainer page essentially, so you can search directly for who uh, is available in your state. Um, but then we have other training organizations that sort of fall into those other buckets I was talking about. So ways to search for community colleges or technical schools, um, things like that. Uh, search, you know, other databases for HVAC training providers, um, things for searching for WIOA or workforce funded, you know, using Department of Labor dollars um, for workforce services, find ways to find your local economic development agencies, different organizations like that, um, way to find small business development centers. And those economic development, small business development center examples um, are more about if you are interested, one of those allowable activities was about like general business support for contractors. And so um, those are agencies that may be doing that um, already or are going to be great ways to sort of connect with contractors and small businesses in your area. So again, this is sort of a way to find everyone that's involved, um, depending on, on how you as a state decide you want to use these funds and the kinds of programs that you want to either fund or create. You know, all of these uh, partners may not be relevant to you, but we want to sort of, again, put them all out there so that you um, have them. I will also say as a note that um, DOE is putting together a teaming partners list that will be available on the contractor training grants webpage. Um, and if you have questions specifically about that, Mary can talk about it again at the end. So there will be a, lo a lot of resources to help find people who can help implement some of these things in your state. Um, okay. 
All right, the, the next few slides in this section um, uh, offer some things to think about and guiding questions to help if you are reaching out to new partners. I know a lot of people on this call, we couldn't see the results of the poll, but I would guess that a number of you do have partnerships with existing organizations, whether they're workforce organizations or other otherwise. So, um, but some people may be sort of entering into this world for the first time. So, um, you know, the program that you decide you want to do will impact the type of partners that you want to engage and the questions you want to ask, but again, as a starting place, um, before you reach out and start talking to people, you want to be prepared uh, on paper or internally in your mind um, to be able to explain, you know, what role you think that you are, that you're wanting them to play and the level of commitment and the type of commitment that you want to ask from them. So here are some examples of the types of roles that partners could help fill. So this could be developing curriculum, providing training, hard skills, soft skills, both are allowable, um, supporting with like advertisement or recruitment of trainees, especially this can be important if you're trying to focus on uh, promoting uh, deeper diversity of your trainees, you may need to reach out to different types of partners to help reach those potential audiences. Um, similar things if you're wanting to provide wraparound services beyond specifically just training and credentialing, um, finding organizations that can do that. Uh, you know, so, uh, and if you're not familiar with the term wraparound services, this is like additional um, support that can help people going through a training program be more successful in completing the program and getting to employment. It can look like, you know, assistance with transportation or childcare reimbursement, things like that. Um, so um, the other thing you might want to involve people in is program evaluation, and that's going to be the topic of the second webinar we're doing in about a month. Um, but the, again, you may also want help in connecting your trainees to jobs um, or actually getting employer partners involved in whatever it is that you are developing. Next slide. Um, so here, here are some examples of questions for the different types of groups. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them. We actually have a whole lot more questions to, for each of these that are in the appendix of this slide deck when you eventually see it. Um, but just to give you a sense of different things you may want to ask these different types of partners. So for training or certifying organizations, you might want to ask them um, like what what are challenges you would see if you had to quickly ramp up their training to incorporate more people? Um, and you can use that, of course, to help design the program that you're doing, um, address those potential pinpoints. You may want to ask about how they currently approach recruitment. So again, um, from an equity lens, you know, maybe there are ways that you can help in improving the, the sort of diversity of people that they are recruiting um, and how they do that. On the next slide. Um, if you're talking with uh, organizations that provide wraparound services, you may want to ask, you know, do they already have existing partnerships with relevant training program or related training programs that you could sort of build off of? Uh, and of course, you want to know who are the populations that they work with? Do they align with whatever priority populations you're identifying in other parts of the ALRD? Next slide. Um, if you're talking with nonprofit or community partners, which could be supporting you in a number of different ways, um, again, you want to talk to them about if they have the capacity or resources to support you with, with advertising or training or recruiting or wraparound services. Um, I will say, you know, sort of spo spoiler alert, nonprofits, even when they're missing the line may not always have a ton of staff capacity or resources and so you definitely want to be prepared in in any of these conversations to to share both what you are wanting from these people but also what you can offer to support them and then the, in the work that they are doing to make sure that the things you're doing are aligned with both of your goals and your missions um, and then for potential employers that you may want to engage to directly hire the people that you're training, um, you may want to get a sense of like how many staff do they employ now, what does their expected growth look like, you might want to talk to them about the wages that they offer now and see if that um, is aligned with some of the things you are talking about in your state. Um, you may also want to know how they are, how they currently training, train their staff, right, so understand how they do that and you can connect to the people they're already working with on their training. Um, and that's training both like new skills training and then continuing education. Um, yeah, so th these were just sort of, sort of samples to get you thinking. There are far more questions uh, that you can sort of mull over that are offered in the appendix of this particular document. And we can move to the next section. Okay, I have not been paying attention to the, to the chat. Before I keep going, are there any questions that you saw that I should answer now? Okay, great. 
onward and upward. So um, this Allison, section- Sorry to interrupt. Oh, I might yeah. just pose one question that is on um, estimating demand, the methodology you shared using the homes and here allocations. So Martin asked, how should we estimate the total investment in efficiency and electrification induced by programs such as the IRA rebates? Is there a standard methodology for doing so or source of data for measure costs by state? And what should we assume as the distribution of measures supported by a particular program? The, I know there's a lot of questions. Do you, do you want to speak to that briefly uh, before we move on? Yeah, I can I can do my best. And if I miss things, uh, help me help me to not miss sure. them. So yeah. um, uh, so there, it, you know, there's information and there's guidance with the rebates that they can only cover, you know, up to a certain portion. So, um, so you can definitely use that information as one place. Uh, I might ask Taylor to search for this for a little bit. NREL has a database of uh, energy residential energy uh, measure costs. Um, I forget exactly what it's called, but I will say that the it's national and it is in the process of being updated. So the numbers are not totally up to date, uh, depending on how soon you need this. Um, it's supposed to be updated by the end of the calendar year. I don't know an exact date. I don't know if you do, Taylor, but I know that it's in the works and they're actively working on it right now. Um, so I would say, again, that's going to be national. So it's not necessarily going to get to if you have special circumstances in your state that make things um, different uh, in cost. Uh, so that is a place that, so if you can get that total cost and then you can sort of compare it to what the rebate is, that may be a way for you to try to estimate um, what that might look like in your state. Uh, we're asking you to do a lot of multiplication and division in this in this work, um, but you're all smart people. Um, so I'm trying to think. So there's that. I know I've seen cost estimates for some of this stuff, like for individual states. Most The most recent project I've worked on is in California, which again may not may or may not be like a relevant point of reference, but I can probably search for those later if it feels useful or we can talk about them in the office hours that we're gonna be hosting over the next couple of weeks. Um, but if you wanna use those as like another point of comparison, um, but that database, if I don't know if Taylor's put it in there, if she's gonna look for it, but. I'll add also that this the starting point for determining your total investment is the is the allocate the formula allocation for you under the home energy rebate programs. So that would be in the home energy rebates ALRD, which I can paste in the chat. Yeah. I feel like there was something else that was asked that I didn't answer. What that. should we assume as the distribution of measures supported by a particular program? I think that's maybe that's more of a heat uh, a, excuse me, a rebate planning yeah. question than a workforce planning question. Yeah. And it's a great one, just maybe not within our own understanding, but I appreciate yeah. it, Martin. Yeah. Um, so that will, yeah, that will have to do with how so this is where like, we're, we're asking, we're trying to allow you to get some of these workforce dollars before you go hard and fast on, on implementing the rebates, but you have to have some sense of how you think that rebate structure might work or or put something in, well, I, I shouldn't say this, Mary, but I wonder if there's the opportunity, can you say, based on these assumptions of what we know now, this is our estimate, it may change, like, would that be an okay language to include in an ALRD? Yeah, in an application, I think it would. We recognize whatever you submit by January 31st is a snapshot in time, and it's subject subject to change, especially once once you get more information as you begin to implement these programs. So we understand that targets might change. Thanks. Okay. I think that's all right now. There are okay. a lot of other good questions that we can turn back to at the end. Okay. That sounds great. Um, okay. So this next section is, is part D and this is like the part two of that first section I did where we were looking at supply and demand. So um, for part D, the ALRD asks uh, states to present labor market information produced by federal or state departments of labor, including three things, um, current rates of employment, forecasts for gro growing or declining industries and wage distributions. And the focus for all of this really is at the occupation level versus like the industry level. So um, the guidance that I'm about to provide here in the next few slides is based on data available through the US 
Bureau of Labor Statistics or BLS website. Um, and since the focus of this question again is on occupations, we're using, there are multiple ways that BLS organizes um, employment information. Um, and we're gonna be talking about things related to the SOC code, SOC. So that stands for Standard Occupational Classification. It's an international code. Um, if you're familiar with ONET, um, it's the basis for that uh, as well. Um, but uh, I, we have a quick poll question and we're having technical difficulties with our polls, but we're gonna ask it anyway. So um, before I go into tons of detail, I would be curious to see, um, you know, who has used BLS, if this is brand new to most people. Oh, this is great. We're getting it in real time. Um, so it's a mix so far in people that have responded to this, but it looks like more people have, are not familiar with BLS um, than have. So for the people who have used it, you're, you might know more than I'm about to share, but um, I'm, I wanna sort of provide a, a standard starting place for everybody. Um, and in this thing, we talk about SOC codes and NAIC codes. So SOC again is this occupation level information. NAICS codes, just for your reference, gets to more industry uh, wide information. So occupations are sort of nestled under that, but we're gonna be talking today about that, um, but that about that stuff. Again, a reminder that uh, SCEP encourages you all to work with your state um, workforce or labor organizations. Most of them are gonna be very familiar with what I'm about to talk about today. Um, there are also states out there, I know, I don't know if there are people on this call, but there are states out there who have produced their own um, energy job reports or uh, may just have their own occupational sort of interpretations on BLS data. And so you are absolutely welcome to also use those, use whatever feels most um, valuable and relevant to the work that you're trying to do. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna give some, some stuff out there that you can use as a starting place. So uh, next, slide. Okay, so um, there are a lot of ways that you can search for data on the Bureau of Labor Statistics website. And if you try to find stuff yourself, it can be a little bit confusing. So um, uh, Taylor, if you want to, the link that's on here, if you want to drop it in the chat, if anybody wants to follow along with me and have lots of fun here. Um, so the link that I'm showing here, and I've got a screenshot of like what it looks like when you fill out this search page, um, but it allows you to, to select multiple occupations for your state. So you can se select one geography, multiple applications. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're the, I'll talk about which occupations we have just in a second, that's on the next slide, but you'll select which occupations you're interested in, um, select your state, uh, and then you're going to select also, there's this, um, what types, what types of data do you want to find? So the ones that I am suggesting, there are others that you can pull from, and you'll see if you start to go through this, but um, the ones most relevant to the ALRD are employment, annual or uh, median or mean wages, and location quotient. If you don't know what that means, I'm going to talk about it in a bit. Don't worry about it. Select them. <laughs> Just go with it. Um, and then you want to know the release date. So um, the most recent data available is 2022. So you probably want to select that. Um, and then the format that you want to get this information in, you can either have it show up as like an HTML web page, which is what I'll show a screenshot of in the next page. Um, or you can download it as an Excel thing and sort of mess with things there. So um, if you go to the next page, so when you're going and, and you have to identify these codes, and again, the Bureau of Labor Statistics website is not the most user-friendly, um, apologies there, um, but these are actually codes that are uh, outlined in the ALRD, so SCEP has helped do some of this work ahead of time, but um, under the, the heading of construction and extraction occupations, you'll want to sort of scroll down and find, you know, these are some examples of occupations you could search for, so electricians, plumbers, insulation workers, mechanical insulation workers, if that feels relevant to you, it may not. Um, that tends to be more of something in the commercial space, but um, those occupations and then HVAC contractors are in a different category. <laughs> so then you'll need to go down to the installation maintenance and repair, maintenance and repair occupations um, and, and select HVAC contractors there. So those are the ones that are most relevant, again, to the, to the work being done through this ALRD, through the rebates. Um, if other ones feel relevant to you, you, you can, you could, that's, that is definitely your choice. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, so this is if you if you select like the HTML 
uh, format for your results, you'll see something like this. So uh, this is an example I did for Colorado. It's where I live, made it easy for me. Um, so here you can see that for these three particular occupations that I selected, you have information on the employment. That's the number of workers in the state for each of those. You get annual mean wages and median. And if you have questions about the differences, we can probably go into them in a different time. Um, and then it gets, so that's average for the, all of those occupations. And then it does also say location quotient um, for your state. Don't worry about that. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it's pretty straightforward and it's a nice way to do all of that. If you go to the next slide. So some things to consider. Um, there is a SOC code for energy auditors, but you can't get BLS data for it, which is unfortunate. Um, so uh, just be aware of that. Um, also understand that this is all workers in this occupation. It's not just, right, you have um, residential and commercial HVAC workers who sometimes have different types of training, often, always, uh, have different types of training required. Um, so just understanding some of those things as you're putting these, these data together that you may want to just think about when you're formulating what you're doing, but also um, may want to make some of those caveats in the data that you're presenting in your in your ALRD, ALRD response. And again, location quotient I'll talk about here in a second. But so that's for understanding current employment and wages, which were two of the pieces asked for in this question. The third piece that this particular question asks about is about employment projections. So this is where if your state has done some work in this area, that might be a great place to go because there isn't um, a super great place to go for sort of long range employment projections by occupation and by state. So what I'm gonna share here, you can get occupation projections at the national level through BLS. Um, so we're gonna talk about that and how you could maybe use that and make adjustment adjustments. So this is just a screenshot of the search page. This one's a little bit uh, easier and Taylor, if you wanna put the link to that in the chat, you'll also get it when you get these slides, um, but it does projections to 2030. Uh, so you wanna use those same occupations I talked about a couple of slides ago um, and it'll spit out something like this that talks to you about what's oh, 20, 2031 not 2030. So it'll give you employment in 2021, employment in 2031, sort of the change in the percent change. So again, this is national, but but thinking about that percent change, um, you can maybe apply to whether these are growing or declining, you know, industries or how much they are projected to grow in the future, not industries, occupations. Um, on the next slide, um, just some, some this is, this is one where I can't quite tell you what to do with this, but again, that's a national projection. And so you're gonna have to determine whether you think your state's economy for those particular occupations or industries is similar enough to the national economy that that's a useful projection. So um, location quotient, which was a thing that, was, that I talked about <laughs> earlier, um, is one tool that can help you sort of understand how similar your, your state economy is for these particular things compared to the national economy. So um, it's a, a slightly confusing concept. I'm going to do my best here. But it's basically it compares um, the share of jobs in a certain occupation to all the jobs in your local place compared to what that share is at a national level. And it's based around um, a one. So a location quotient of one means that whatever occupation you are looking at, um, electricians say, for example, um, if you have an, a location quotient of one for your state, it means that uh, there are sort of as many, uh, how can I say this, that, um, the electricians show up as frequently or they make up the same percentage of total jobs in your state as they do in the nation. And LQ, a location quotient below one means that these jobs are less prevalent in your state economy than they are in the national economy. And a location quotient above one indicates that those jobs are more prevalent in your state than they are in the national economy. So back you know, a few slides ago, I don't, you probably don't remember, but you can go look at this later. Um, for Colorado's, the, the location quotients they had for uh, like HVAC was one, for electricians it was 1.28, for plumbers it was 1.19. So in general in Colorado, these jobs already show up more um, frequently um, in the economy than they do sort of at a nationwide scale. And so like, what, why, why am I telling you this and how does it help you? This is just one indicator that can help your state to understand again, how similar your um, local economy for these things are compared to the national economy. Um, and it may be helpful for this projections question, like if you want to use those national projections for the occupations, if you think they're relevant to what's going on in your state. So it is a bit confusing. 
we can talk about it more in office hours if you want. Um, and and I want to do one more poll also before we move on from from this Bureau of Labor Statistics data um, to like what other data sets have any of you used if you've used other ones are they local data sets you know state state reports um, other BLS search things, because those definitely exist, different ways of searching data. But if you have other things on here, we'd love to capture them so that we can share them back with the group. Um, and we'll leave that poll up. I'm definitely getting behind on time. So uh, we'll move on to the next slide, but we can leave that poll open for a little while. Okay, we are in the home stretch, everybody. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, so this is for, now we're on to component 1E. 1E asks states to provide an assessment of residential and commercial energy auditor availability and readiness. Um, as a note, the ALRD says that you can respond to either 1E or 1F. I'm gonna talk about 1E first and then 1F, um, but I'm gonna talk about some resources that can help you get a rough estimate of how many energy auditors uh, may already exist in your state. So um, on the next slide, um, we've provided, and again, you're going to have these slides and all of these links, but these are links to the entities that are approved by this program for certifying energy auditors or energy uh, assessors. So ASHRAE, AEE, BPI, ResNet, Home Energy Score. So these links, again, will take you directly to the search pages on each of those websites where it says, like, find a, find a certified energy auditor. And so you can put in your state information or your geography, and you can get a list of the people that they have registered within their certification um, databases. Um, and at start can, you know, so, there are some limitations, right? This is about getting a rough estimate of that availability. Um, just because someone holds a credential in your state doesn't mean that like they are actively seeking out energy auditor business. It would be, I think, up to you if you want to contact each of them and ask about sort of their, you know, availability um, or readiness. Um, you know, there's also going to be differences based on the population density of your state. So states like California, New York, or Texas may see more, far more, and you may only have a handful of them in less populated states, and that's to be expected, but just to understand that going in. Um, and so just another point, in addition to these search functions, you can also talk to, um, you know, utilities uh, in your area who may work with energy auditors, but again, to understand not just how many there are, but that question about availability and readiness um, may require some person-to-person -person conversations. Okay. Next slide. All right, final, final slide for me. So this is 1F. Um, so a, a reminder, you can do either uh, 1E or 1F. And 1F asks you to provide a skills assessment report in existing education and training programs, such as on new technologies, latest best practices, and newly launching programs. So the guidance we're providing here today is relatively minimal. Really, this is about um, determining the skills and technologies that those existing uh, education and training providers you you identified back in uh, 1C, um, figuring out if, if you have training programs that teach to the skills that you need to implement some of what's going on. Um, what's going on in your state. So this could take some some deeper digging. Um, you know, there are definitely, for example, um, a lot of HVAC programs around the country that already incorporate training, you know, at, whether that's through a union or at a community college level, for example, or a trade school um, that already incorporate uh, education around heat pumps, right? But there are definitely places where that's not an automatic part of the curriculum, right? And so there may be people exiting those programs who don't have those skills and that becomes a gap, right? That you may wanna address with this. So this is about sort of doing some of the legwork building on those existing partners and training organizations to figure out where those gaps exist. There are states where this sort of inventory or gap analysis may have already been done, um, but if it doesn't exist, it just again may require you digging a little bit deeper, not just listing those organizations, but talking to some of them or going onto their web pages to see um, what the courses are that they already provide, for example. Okay. And I did it, and I did it in time. Um, thank you. Oh wait, we is that it? no? That's it for now. So I'm going to pass it over to Jeff at PNNL, and he's going to talk about some additional resources to help you all in um, actually filling out and submitting the ALRD. Thanks, Allison. Uh, take a breath and a glass of water. Um, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, so briefly, just going to talk about resources that DOE provides. Um, some of those currently under development and some existing today that can be leveraged in submissions. Um, we can go to the next slide, Taylor. 
So those in development currently, um, these best practices could be used as, as guidance and potentially emulated in preparing a submission. Um, this will be a curated content and examples of, of state workforce programs and other workforce programs that are um, outstanding and potentially um, relevant and could be valuable content to, um, to mirror. Uh, the narrative document template is written uh, or will be developed such that it is a, um, a guidance template that can be used for submissions. So it, it's a really a submission form. Um, it is not complete yet. I saw a question in the chat about if it would be developed or available this month. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a date yet. Um, it will be distributed through the EE Workforce Program email. So those that received the invite to this, um, communications, maybe an update about the date for that, but then also finally delivering that out. Um, two states will come via that list. We can go to the next slide. So resources that are available today, uh, the Building Science Education Solution Center um, is a curated database of content, uh, free training modules and materials um, that we have curated or produced internally that could be used and incorporated in workforce training programs. Um, these are these are open to everyone, but really they're they're not designed for a contractor to go there and, and see the content. They're designed for a training program to incorporate and build out skills. Um, these can be explored by uh, technology area or by workforce area and and the ability to to filter through those and look at different components that may be incorporated to build a curricula or for one of your partners to potentially put a curricula together that that meets the expectations that um, that the DOE is, has for for various technologies and how those will be executed in the field. We can go to the next slide. Um, further building science education um, training programs offers recognition for different training programs aimed at, at job types. Those three bulleted here, uh, heat pump programs, heat pump water heater, and energy assessment or energy auditor programs. Um, and those are different organizations, some that are, that are open and available, some that do charge a fee for their program. Uh, but those are training curricula that meets DOE or aligns with DOE goals uh, on each of those web pages, which will be linked in the deck, as you can see in the slide. Um, you can see the criteria and the checklist for what they include in their curricula um, and links to and access to those. If you have other training partners, um, we at Pacific Northwest are able to review those. Um, that at email address that's on the slide comes to me and colleagues. And we can review those and recognize any other programs that meet the criteria. And the lists that are that are at these three pages are growing as we as we reach out to organizations or as they come to us. I think that's it for that slide. And with that, I can turn it back to Mary. Thanks, Jeff. So I see there have been a bunch of questions in the chat. I've been trying to answer them as they come in. I'll speak to a few right now, but please feel free to chime in if, if folks have others. I know Martin had an early question about project officers and DOE is working to streamline project officers for a given state across multiple DOE programs. It will vary by state whether one project officer serves as your PO for both SCP rebates and contractor training. So it's hard for us to say at this time. But regardless, we're, DOE will make sure that we're coordinating across project officers for multiple programs, especially for contractor training and rebates and state energy program. Uh, Cameron had a great uh, question on partners, whether there's an envisioned number of partners that you all should be considering. No, there isn't, and that will depend by state. Uh, it depends on what you and your agency feel most comfortable leading and maybe where you would rather bring in an external partner. For example, it, you could engage a community college to develop the technical curricula that you'll be using, or you could work with a community-based organization to develop wraparound services and recruit training program candidates. 
those are just examples, uh, but it will really vary based on what your needs are and, and where you want outside help. The last question I'll, I'll address up front is on letters of support. I see there are there's a lot of concern from a few states in the chat about this requirement, and DOE is now thinking through how we can give you flexibility on the, the requirement for letters of support. We recognize that many of you have state laws that don't allow you to get those letters of support. And so we're we're still updating the ALRD to reflect the, the deadline extension that we emailed to all of you. And uh, we're considering an update on letters of support as part of th those revisions, which we're working to publish as soon as possible alongside the program guidance that, that Jeff mentioned and that we recognize you all need yesterday in order to, to refine your applications and get internal approvals for them. I think I covered most of the questions. There was one on allowable costs and we have a draft written answer we're gonna publish on the Q&A page. I'll paste a link to that in the chat. Uh, and I've included this a few other times during this webinar, but thank you for many of you for emailing us questions. We run those through internal approvals as quickly as possible and we post the answers on that web page. Um, I see a question about where slides will be. Those will be on the program website that is linked on the Q&A page. I'll add that link now in the chat as well. Are there, any, are there other questions that we can address now from folks? Okay. I, I will say really quick, there was a question from Tom, Mary, that um, from Alaska saying that they were, uh, they have sort of workforce attri attrition and difficulties with meeting the current demand for some of these occupations um, versus uh, adding to that. And so his question specifically was about how to address this in the application. I don't know if you want to respond and I can um, definitely throw some thoughts in as well. Yeah, thanks for the flag, Allison. Yeah, I think, uh, so I mentioned in my response in the chat and we'll expand upon it, that states can target new workers, existing workers or contracting firms. And I think in this situation, maybe engaging existing electricians or others who are incumbent members of the workforce would make sense. And also designing your the credentials that you train people for to be stackable so that they are they combine well with other certifications and would allow that person kind of versatility maybe in the off season when construction is not underway in Alaska. Jeff, do you have thoughts? Um, just a quick add that we do have different modules of building science education that are targeted at upskilling. So there are some content that's based on upskilling as opposed to new workforce training. And a number of those programs have upskilling type modules or, or various training that would be in that wheelhouse. Great flag, thanks Jeff. Well, if there aren't other, let's see, I'm looking There's at the There's a follow-up. There's sort of a follow-up yes. from Tom. Oh, can you can we use funds to attract bringing trades from other states? I'm not sure I understand that question. We do encourage states to braid funding with, with the DOE contractor training dollars. I'm not, if you want to, if you could expand on what you mean by bringing trades from other states, that would be helpful. But if Allison or Jeff have thoughts, please feel free to weigh in. My my interpretation of that, Mary, is like re, uh, recruiting companies from that are located in other states to relocate workers temporarily or permanently, maybe um, to address that. Yeah, I th I don't. I, there's nothing. I don't. I can't think of anything that would disallow doing that. Yeah, and I I will say so. I know Mary's going to ask about. Um, we're going to ask about sort of additional questions. And we have some follow up office hours that we're going to bring up here in a second, but um, that that bigger question of of attrition and building the workforce pipeline is is um, in general, like a little bit of a longer term <laughs> um, effort uh, that that could be addressed using some of these funds right so if you have an underlying issue with broader pipeline work that and you want I mean I, I have a maybe this is a question for you Mary could could funds be used towards, you know expanding CTE, relevant CTE programs in high schools or 
you know, there is a thing, a bullet about public awareness things. So I think you, you need to look at this at a state level. And if that's where a heavier need is to support this work, you know, it's up to you to make that case in your ALRD response. Yeah, I think Allison put it put it well. We're we're allowing a lot of flexibility on how you use these fu these funds, and I think we might need to see it in context to better understand, uh, to give a better answer. But if you want to email the the EE workforce programs inbox, maybe with a bit more detail, that would be great. I see Tom added a follow up note on covering housing for workers brought in from out of state. We are allowing this these funds to be used for wraparound services and and maybe non-technical costs but we're also that I think that I'm going to point back to my answer on on the fact that we're still drafting a more formal response on allowable costs so I'm hesitant to give a firm final answer on that question now thanks Taylor if you could go to the next slide we're if, if folks have other questions we would welcome them I think we're going to do a poll on this slide for anything you'd like us to cover in the next webinar or in future office hours so we can come prepared to to present and share resources on the topics you're interested in. While you're thinking, I'll just point folks to the slide that summarizes the dates and times for those upcoming sessions. We hope you'll join us. And uh, But if you have questions in the meantime, send them to the EE Workforce Programs inbox that I'll put in the chat now. And I will just reiterate this poll, hopefully everyone's seeing this final poll that's up here. Um, this will be, if you have questions that we didn't answer today um, or that we didn't answer fully, or you know, definitely let us know, we'll be available at these office hours for the next couple of Thursdays that are intended to be related to this particular topic that we went through today um, and then other things later, but um, let us know what questions so that we can prepare more information and help you all. Taylor, if you want to go to the next slide, that would be great. This is our last slide. We've just included that email address one more time. Thank you all for listening so actively and asking so many great questions and for your work on your applications. We know that we've included a lot in this ALRD and we're really excited to work with you to, to position you for success. Thanks.